Welcome to Discovery Watch with John Kaiser. I'm your host, Jim Goddard. Welcome back to the show, John. Jim, I'm glad to be back. John, a Discovery Watch listener had a question about Alexco Resource Corporation, which owns the Keno Hill Silver Project in the Yukon. Is there anything resembling a discovery unfolding at Alexco? Well, Jim, Discovery Watch is normally focused on resource juniors that are engaged in discovery exploration because that is an area where I think the biggest gains are possible if the junior does make a substantial discovery. But I'm also interested in juniors with more advanced projects where there is some unusual twist to it uh, that uh, people aren't really aware of. And an example of such a twist is uh, FPX Nickel, which we have featured on Discovery Watch. It has uh, completed a, a PEA on the Dakar project in central British Columbia. And what's unusual about it is that that is an extremely low-grade nickel deposit, so 0.1%. Uh, and it involves a style of mineralization that turns out to be quite unusual in the world. Uh, uh, it's, it's a natural stainless steel alloy, nickel iron, and uh, they believe that uh, this could become a major source of nickel using simple, low-cost gravity magnetic separation. But it needs a $6 plus price, so at the moment it's sitting there waiting, but it's also interesting in that the magnesium content of this, uh, the tailings of this multi-billion dollar system could ultimately end up as a carbon sink, uh, uh, pu- pulling carbon dioxide and fixing it permanently into the tailings. So that's an example of a Discovery Watch company that isn't, they're not looking to find anything. They're waiting for uh, metal price to improve so that this new source of uh, metal could go into production. Another example is um, Scandium International, which has completed a definitive feasibility study for its Ningen Scandium project in in, in Australia and even has a permit and is basically waiting now for the conditions to emerge for doing a hundred million dollar capex financing to put this uh, project into production. Now this is unusual because there is no primary scandium uh, supply in the world because uh, historically the grade of scandium and and rocks uh, has been too low to mine as a standalone mine. And even though scandium does wonderful things to aluminum when alloyed with it, the world has not been able to to do much with it because it's only available as byproduct supply from uh, 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 rare earth mines, uh, uranium uh, in situ leaching, and more recently from titanium dioxide waste stripping. So here we have something where in the last 15 years, a new style of scandium-enriched laterite deposits were discovered in New South Wales of Australia and various juniors, of which uh, Scandium International is the leader, have been advancing these, and this could dramatically change the ability of the aluminum industry to compete with uh, the uh, uh, steel industry uh, where lightweight uh, applications are required. Um, So Alexco, it's on the surface, it looks like a tiresome silver optionality play because it is a high-grade silver system that the company has. And of the, and, and in this style, it's so normally of interest to silver bugs. And silver bugs are a fanatic subset of gold bugs. Um, but the problem with uh, silver is that unlike gold, which has its own asset class because it is essentially useless uh, for most industrial applications at the price that, that it has. Silver is only 1% to 2% of the price of gold and has many industrial applications. And unfortunately, it is a byproduct uh, from many different types of uh, base metal mines. But historically, there has been a ratio between the price of gold and silver. And in fact, silver uh, was... Uh, uh, used as money in the days when uh, physical metal still functioned as money. And uh, silver bugs have latched onto this idea of the ratio. And right now, the ratio of the gold price to the silver price is around 85. It has been down there at uh, uh, 25, 30, 
30 to 1 uh, uh, several times since 1990. And you can tell that Alexco caters to the uh, silver bug audience uh, because uh, uh, if you go to slide 25 of their corporate presentation, they do show this chart and they show the highlights where every time uh, uh, the ratio gets up there into that 70 to uh, 85 range shortly after it plunges. And of course, uh, what everybody is hoping is uh, this won't happen because gold's going to collapse to $600, but that silver will actually double. And then if gold continues to rise, we'll will track something more like a 30 uh, 30 to to 1 to 1 ratio. So that's the uh, that's the sort of silver bug dream, the fascination with primary silver projects. Uh, I personally believe $2000 uh, um uh gold as a real price gain is conceivable in the current environment where Trump is trying to somehow interrupt uh, China's gradual rise towards what will ultimately be equal uh, economic, possibly even uh, military status with the United States. And um, I, I personally believe this is probably going to uh, destabilize the situation, accelerate the shift away from uh, the U.S. dollar as the world's single reserve currency. It'll still take a long time for this to happen, but I believe we are heading into a period where there will be great concern that this is underway and may not be reversible. So I'm a gold bull, but I'm not so much a silver bull, but I'm not going to uh, argue with uh, uh, silver bugs if they are into uh, the uh, uh, silver type place. Now, Alex Cole has been recommended by newsletter writers uh, almost from the, the day it went public in January 2006 by IPO. Um, uh, it hit a high of 975 in early 2011 when Eric Sprott was helping push it towards $50. But since then, uh, it's uh, fallen as low as 38 cents in 2015. But after we had that uh, rally in 2016, it got as high as 331 in mid-August 2016. And since then, the stock price has been downhill which pretty much has been the situation with the resource juniors in general. Um, right now, it's just hovering above a dollar. There's 117 million shares fully diluted. Uh, uh, it's threatening to break down, possibly because uh, there was $9 million worth of flow-through paper done at uh, at $1.92 earlier this year. Uh, however, the stock also trades on the New York Stock Exchange in what used to be the, the Amex uh, that got absorbed by it. So it does have a U.S. audience, and I'm not too concerned about the flow-through paper not being absorbed by a, a, a audience of people interested in, in the silver bug angle. Now, where the company is problematic is that in March of 2017, they published an N, uh, a PEA for putting the... Uh, uh, four high-grade silver deposits at uh, Kino Hill back into production with the existing facility of 400 tons per day. And using a 5% discount rate, they only came up with an after-tax NPV of $79.4 million. The internal rate of return was good at, at 75%, and that's, of course, because the infrastructure is already there and the CapEx to get things rolling again is only uh, $27 million. Um, the uh, eight-year mine would uh, process an average of 843 grams per ton silver with 3.3% lead and 4.6% zinc. Now, that's 27 ounce per ton silver. So this is high-grade silver, and this is what silver bugs like to see. And at that grade, this is actually a primary silver mine with zinc and lead as byproducts, not the other way around. But where things get ugly is that the base case price used for that was $19.35 for silver. So what is silver today? It's about $14.25.30. So it's uh, uh, the base case price is 36% higher. And if you take the NPV that you got at the higher base price, price, you get a $0.68 cents per share target price. 
So you're kind of saying, well, okay, uh, well, they are now working on a pre-feasibility study that they hope to have done in the first quarter. Uh, usually pre-feasibility studies make everything worse because the engineers get into the picture and really fine-tune everything. Uh, and they hope to make a production decision at the, in Q2 of next year and have the final water license that they need ready to be starting to produce in the second half of next year. But at 14 and a quarter, if that's where the, uh, the silver price still is then, nobody is going to make a decision to put this back into production. If, so the story really is one for investors who believe that silver will rebound to $20. And if it starts trending towards $30, well, then this whole project starts to look really, really interesting. Um, the company is still in pretty good financial shape. Uh, they have about $13 million working capital left at the end of uh, end of September. However, they do have a $3 million a month, uh, uh, a quarter burn rate uh, for for overhead. And if silver stays a dog, this could become problematic for the company. So for the moment, I would say it's only ideal for silver bugs who do think that silver is going to go back on that trajectory towards $50, and, and, and not because uh, of hyperinflation or, or, or the U.S. dollar collapsing to nothing, and which, which simply drags up the cost, but the, simply in real terms, which allows this project to become um, much more valuable than suggested by the $19 uh, uh, PEA uh, base case price. But that's not what I find interesting about AlexCo. What's interesting about it, you have to go back to its origin. Uh, it was originally owned by Nova Gold, which had acquired it from when Ron Nedelitsky's uh, Loki Gold put the Brewery Creek uh, pr production uh, pr project into uh, production. They stuffed that into AlexCo. Uh, they did the IPO, but before they did that, they also acquired a private uh, environmental remediation company uh, which had been working on reclaiming the Brewery Creek project in the Yukon since 2003. And Brewery Creek uh, operated as a heap leach uh, uh, a gold mine from 1996 until 2002. And uh, this company was headed by uh, two people, Clinton Nauman and Brad Thrall. And these are the people who are still in charge of the company. Clinton is the CEO and chairman, and Brad is the president. So these people who be were part of this uh, remediation project, uh, they are still in charge of this company. But shortly after the IPO, that's when the Kino Hill project came into the company. They won the bid uh, for acquiring the whole uh, district and running the cleanup job. So the company acquired this through the cleanup activity, which it had brought in-house, which was run by the people who still run the company. And even today, the company it has a division that does environmental remediation, including ongoing work at the Keno Hill cleaning up problems that they did not cause, but were caused by a uh, previous previous operators and and this business did about 11 million dollars in revenue for the last 9 months and they actually managed to make an operating profit of 3.9 million dollars on this and and they have contracts on four other cleanup sites in Colorado where they are doing work now this is interesting because right now the company is in a holding pattern waiting for a silver price to go up, waiting for the completion of the PEF, PFS, uh, and, and they've got a line of credit in place to, to raise more money. Uh, the fact that they are New York listed, they've got a, a, a shelf prospectus ready to, to start raising money if we get back back into an uptrend. And you say, well, well, even, you know, this means silver goes to 30 bucks. Uh, maybe maybe then the stock might be worth a, a couple of dollars a share. That That's not really very interesting. If we get back into a strong resource sector market with metal prices trending higher, what can this company do to grow itself? Well, when we get those conditions, then there's lots of capital available and lots of competition for projects, so the prices of everything goes up. But the interesting twist, which I like about Alexco, is that it has this in-house 
environmental remediation capacity, which when bidding on projects, former mine sites that do require cleanup, that would give this company an edge to outbid uh, without blowing themselves up, competition to whom the, the, the fund managers and that are now shoving lots of money. So Alexco Resource Corp. is not just a silver optionality play for uh, silver bugs, uh, hoping that the Kino Hill goes back into production uh, and, uh, and, and, and profits from silver going way, way up. But it's also a po- potential growth platform where they can le- leverage the very nature of this story into expanding and acquiring other projects and building if and when we get back into a resource sector bull market. We'll have more with John Kaiser right after this. Cypress Development Corp's flagship lithium project is located just east of Alba Marley's Silver Peak Mine in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. A 12-hole exploration drill program for lithium-enriched claystone on Cypress's 100% controlled properties is now underway. Cypress Development Corp trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the pink CYDVF, and on Frankfurt C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Reuters, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the US, AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Welcome back. We're speaking with John Kaiser. John, Scandium International put out news releases during the past couple of weeks. Are we any closer to an offtake agreement? Well, neither of these news releases uh, qualify as an offtake uh, agreement. The one that came out last week was actually an update on a letter of intent that had been signed in early May of this year, which was with uh, Eck Industry, which is a Wisconsin-based uh, um, sandcaster of aluminum alloy parts for the um, aircraft, automotive, uh, and and even marine sector, usually with with their motors and things like that. These are complex parts that you have to cast. And uh, what they reported was that uh, this um, innovation Eck had been working on, uh, uh, which involves an aluminum magnesium cerium alloy. And cerium is the most abundant uh, uh, light rare earth. It's it's also the cheapest rare earth out there. And the the in-house innovation they had done was to discover that uh, uh, cerium added to the standard aluminum magnesium alloy um, did improve its ability to uh, uh, resist a loss of strength under heat conditions. But what the deal was since May was to play with scandium and see if that does an even better job. And the conclusion was that, yes, they can now heat an, an aluminum, uh, uh, cerium, magnesium, scandium alloy part to over 360 degrees Celsius, and the piece does not lose its strength. The problem these days with most of the alloys, even the aluminum magnesium ones, is that if you get the temperature above 240 degrees Celsius, even if it's just for a brief period, the alloy loses its strength and becomes a vulnerability wherever it has been deployed. And the the industry solution is to use a stainless steel part, but uh, the stainless steel part is heavier, and of course it can handle 1,000 degree temperature, so it is overkill for the job. So this is an important news release because you know, Eck, Eck uh, is, um, it appears that not only will it be able to use this innovation for its own uh, um, internal app, uh, production lines, but it also plans to license it. And they have filed for a patent on this. And until the patent is granted, we won't know what the details are. So internally, at least, it's possible that Eck could start using this alloy uh, well before the patent is granted, and this could make be a huge boost for 
using the sand cast uh, alloy, aluminum alloy parts in the industry enhanced with scandium. The other deal, which was, in my view, more important, was with an Australian listed company called Austal, which uh, is involved in making uh, uh, high speed light ships. In fact, they are a supplier of these co littoral combat ships to the United States uh, Navy from their base in the U.S., and they've sold about uh, um, nine of them and have several more on order. And these are expensive uh, ships, you know, so the $800 million ships. And aluminum alloy is relevant to the marine sector because there is a corrosion problem, which uh, they have to do special, especially when they're in seawater, they have to have some special cladding for that, which adds weight to the ship. And, uh, and the future is all about ships that can move very, very quickly. Austal also makes uh, high-speed ferries where, of course, lightweight and being able to move your customers quickly is important. Um, when I talked to George Putnam about this, uh, he said uh, it, it's ironic, the uh, Eck, uh, Eck letter of intent, uh, uh, we did it in May and we got results right away. Uh, this one we've been working for a very, very long time on. But it is a potential blockbuster because in their own diagram of uh, where future demand is going to come from for, for Scandium, uh, they've got it compartmentalized into early adopter, late adopter, and, and price sensitive and price insensitive. The marine application was uh, somewhat price insensitive, which is good when you want to sell Scandium at $2,000 a, a kilo. But the uh, uh, it was... Uh, uh, a fairly late adopter, and there is a certification cycle involved with this alloy. However, they're already using an aluminum magnesium alloy, so the stages for uh, demonstrating, getting it certified are fairly straightforward. There's only uh, scandium being added to it. But the significance to me was that the marine naval application could become a reality a lot sooner than the company had expected. So by finally getting this out into the public domain, um, this tells everybody else, hey, there's something else we can talk about, not just aircraft and cars and maybe trains, but we can also talk about the ship industry as a potential offtake uh, for, 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 for future Scandium supply. So in terms of the offtake deals that this company needs to make funding $100 million at a better price than $0.25, cents, a, a no-brainer event, and perhaps even pull in some, um, some some debt financing as part of it. We are not there yet, but they started announcing the first deals back in January. We have entered the zone where companies can start reporting back uh, 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 the results and starting to make decisions on whether they want to uh, pencil themselves down for two, four, five tons. And, and and the company has also told me that they have other letters of intent uh, in place, but they are absolutely confidential. And uh, I suspect that we may even end up seeing uh, uh, deals where um, a company announces we have an offtake, but there will be a confidential filing with the stock exchange because these other parties apparently uh, involve brand names who do not want anybody to know that they will be using an aluminum scandium alloy two two plus years from now when this uh, Ningen scandium mine is built and commissioned and actually supplying scandium to these offtakers. So 2019, I think, will be a pivotal year for the company where we start seeing these, both these confidential offtake announcements and ones where we see the names of these uh, companies like Act or 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 Austal. Uh, not, not exactly brand names that anybody recognizes on, in the consumer world, but when you add them all up and consider that each one of them is probably only going to take a small portion of their future requirement, uh, this will be a big deal because everybody's now got their eyes on Scandium International and their strategy. They're pushing their own projects along in terms of their flow sheets and getting them ready. And everybody is now aligned and starting to see that uh, this is going to be a market which in a decade grows from 20, 30 tons a year today to 1,000 to 1,500 tons a year worth a couple billion dollars 
just as has happened with the Niobium market, except a lot faster. We'll have more with John Kaiser right after the break. Arctic Star Exploration, operated by a team of proven mine finders, is focused on diamonds in Finland and the Northwest Territories of Canada. Work programs are underway in Finland and Canada. Arctic Star trades on the TSX Venture Exchange symbol ADD, on Frankfurt symbol 82A1, and the OTCQB symbol ASDZF. Please visit our website arcticstar.ca or call us at 604-689-1799. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with John Kaiser. John, Nevada Exploration published an update last week for their South Grass Valley project. Do they have a discovery yet? What they have, Jim, is an extraordinary potential for a major Carlin-type discovery. Now, this story started off as a regional golden groundwater sampling exercise where they they wandered uh, down the whole Grass Valley from not very far from Cortez Hills itself at the northern end all the way to the southern end where, where some companies such as Kennecott had pecked away at some exposed lower plate with, without any joy. And they found uh, golden groundwater anomalies with uh, Carlin-type pathfinders, the you know, the thallium, the arsenic, um, antimony at the northern end, at the southern end. And they have this sort of two and a half kilometer by a thousand kilometer anomaly smack in this valley. It's all covered with gravel. It's blind. Uh, lower plate rocks, which are the preferred host for Carlin-type deposits. Uh, they do outcrop on the edges, but when you sample them, you know, there's there's some evidence, might be something going on, but nothing to really excite anybody to start uh, drilling away. In fact, Kennecott had walked a bit into the valley as part of its goodbye exercise to Nevada and drilled a few holes, but didn't seem to have found anything. The company has now reported the partial results on five holes that they've drilled on these uh, three fences uh, 2,500 meters apart. Um, uh, we've talked about the first hole, which hit the uh, granic uh, intrusion, and, and, and they didn't even bother reporting any results from that because that's not going to have anything in it. But hole two, which is at the northwestern corner, and hole three, they have reported assays. And, and as expected, there is not any... Um, or grade gold in it, uh, maybe 10 to 20 parts per billion, but they do have all the uh, uh, Carlin pathfinders at very elevated levels. And uh, so, so these two holes are about 1,200 meters apart, and uh, they've got, they hit the bedrock at about 170 meters, 180 meters, and the holes were stopped at 500, 600 meters. It's all Lower plate rocks, no upper plate uh, uh, tight rocks to um, you know stymie the deposition of mineralization. They are altered. Uh, they're showing hydrothermal evidence, and the company, if you listen to Wade Hodges, he thinks it's only a matter of time before he discovers a major gold system. And in hole five or hole four, which they drilled at the southeastern corner of this grid, so in other words, like 2,500 meters from the Northern fence. Uh, this one, they had a bit of bad luck in that uh, it turned out the bed, the bedrock was 377 meters deep, and so there's some sort of step faulting going on, uh, north-south running faults that have dropped uh, these blocks of lower plate rocks uh, lower, probably after after all the mineralization happened. But they they also got the same sort of uh, visuals in terms of hydrothermal alteration. Uh, and they managed to see some pyrite in the bottom of that hole, which would be sulfites. Whereas these other holes, uh, they have, once they get into the uh, into the bedrock, uh, it's oxidized down to 400, 500 meters. So if there's a gold deposit squirreled in there somewhere, it will be oxidized and not have the refractory problem. And uh, they have uh, 
reported uh, drilling uh, hole 5. I do not yet know if it's complete, but they hit bedrock at 158, and early observations were. Uh, this is slightly, this is to the west of hole number um, number 4, and it looks uh, somewhat different, but still evidence of a giant hydrothermal system with Carlin-type pathfinders and the sort of low-grade uh, parts per billion in gold that you find on the peripheries of the system. And they would like to uh, drill another eight holes to completely uh, complete the grid and then use that as the basis for uh, vectoring in on where the target actually is within this fairly large area. And you have to think, when you if, if you... If you stand at the end of that valley, you see this vast plain of nothingness, of just gravel, no reason, no outcrop, no reason to stick any hole down. To find a lower plate window, only a couple hundred meters, altered all to hell, lower carbon at the, uh, lower plate carbon at rocks uh, with the pathfinders in it. And to make matters even better, they have been running around with a uh, mercury gas sampling tool and extended it to the north where the groundwater values peter out and seems to be nothing. But the mercury gas signals have extended it another 2,500 meters to the north, which is why they reported staking additional ground to cover what they suspect is a north-south north structural uh, regime within which there is a system that uh, the golden groundwater or the groundwater is not picking it up to the north, which tells them that just because you don't have a groundwater anomaly doesn't mean you don't have a system there, but they feel they are on top of a major blind system which could turn into a very substantial discovery. So we'll have to wait. It's not a discovery yet, but if you ever wanted to get excited about a a target, this is the sort of target in this sort of part of the world where what you would like to place your bet on john thank you so much for the update you're welcome Jim. we've been talking with john kaiser his website kaiserresearch.com i'm jim goddard comments made on discovery watch are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any manner whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time archived online at howstreet.com discovery watch is a production of how street media incorporated